Good morning and welcome to our worship on this fifth Sunday after Trinity. And it's good to see a few different faces here this week as well. Um, if you weren't here last week, um, please don't be alarmed by the lack of books. Uh, we'll guide you through the service as we go. Um, there'll be no collection during the service. We're not allowed to pass things around at the moment. Um, so if you do need to rely on cash for your giving, there'll be a plate to leave it in as you go by at the end. But if you can, please do give online. Um, and for those of you joining us from home, the easiest way for you is by the donations button, button on our website, www.wiltonparish.co.uk. That's that embarrassing bit out of the way. Finally, for those of us here, at the end of the service, please would you remain seated until the end of the organ voluntary so that we can then safely release you from your pews row by row um, in an ordered fashion. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sins, and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. In the wilderness we find your grace. You love us with an everlasting love. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. There is none but you to uphold our cause. Our sin cries out, and our guilt is great. Christ, have mercy. Christ have mercy. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be made whole. Restore us, and we shall know your joy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now we sit for our readings. The response to the psalm is, To you, O Lord, shall all flesh come. To you, O Lord, You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be paid. You that answer prayer, blessed are they whom you cho chose to dwell within your courts. We shall be satisfied with the beauty of your house, by the holiness of your holy temple. To you, O Lord, shall all flesh come. You tend the earth and water it abundantly. You make it rich and fertile. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. To you, O Lord, shall all flesh come. You drench its furrows and level the ridges between. You soften the ground with showers and bless its early growth. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing. 
and the hills be clothed with joy. To you, O Lord, shall all flesh come. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus said the Lord, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the, hill, and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand to greet the gospel. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. The Lord is you. Jesus sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another Sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord May my words and all our thoughts be now and always acceptable to God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Like many others, I suspect, the rectory garden 
has emerged from lockdown in a rather tidier state than it was back in March. There are now pools of sunlight where the sun had not reached for years, if not decades. Patches of wilderness have been transformed into borders. Dead wood has been cleared and the battle of the brambles has been won for the moment. And it's against this background of newfound tidiness that this week I observed another member of our household seeding a new area of grass. First, she weeded the area. Then she raked out the stones. Then she leveled it. Then she scattered the seed evenly over the ground and raked it in. Then she watered it taking care not to underdo it or to drown the poor seeds. All in all, quite a meticulous operation. And I suspect that's the kind of careful attention that a farmer in first century Palestine would have given when sowing their precious crop seed. With the threat of famine never too far away, surely they would take care only to scatter the seed on fertile ground and to keep it watered. The harvest was too vital to lead to chance. So what would they have made of the sower in Jesus' parable, who seems utterly careless, reckless even, with the precious seed? He seems content to allow it to fall on the path to be eaten by birds, or to to fail on shallow, rocky earth or to be lost among sturdier weeds, and only a fraction of the seed actually grows on to produce new grain. I suspect then that to Jesus' first hearers, so much waste would have been utterly bizarre, even quite shocking. Don't forget, the crowds only get the first part of this story, ending with, let anyone with ears listen almost as if Jesus wants them to be disturbed and then to puzzle over what he said. The explanation is saved just for the disciples later. We perhaps tend to hone in on the other side of the story and wonder what kind of seed we are. Are we one of those with a tendency to be distracted from following God's call or too fearful of what others think? or too slow to understand? Or is our halo gleaming bright and the fruits of our labors only too plain for all to see? A sobering thought perhaps, but don't worry, I won't ask you to answer. In any case, I'm not sure that really is the fundamental point of this story. What if it really is about the sower rather than the seed? Is Jesus actually telling us something important about the nature of God? Are we meant to be shocked by the profligate God who scatters his blessings even on the most unresponsive of us, his children, knowing full well that his love will be ignored by some and rejected by others, and that only a few will respond with anything like the gratitude and obedience that is due? And in this, are we meant to recognize Jesus himself, who died for all humanity, whether they know it or not, because it's better to save a few at great cost than none at all? If that is the case, then what first appears to be reckless waste, in fact, turns out to be selfless generosity. That's not unlike the image of Isaiah, of the rain watering the earth indiscriminately so that both crops and people can flourish. No matter if the weeds are given a boost in the process, this is no empty, futile cycle of rain and sun and cloud, rain and sun and cloud. Because by it, God's purpose is accomplished. From that abundance flows life in all its rich diversity. You crown the year with your goodness, the writer of our psalm reflects, and your paths overflow with plenty. 
May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing and the hills be clothed with joy. Through God's generous provision, it seems, not only do crops flourish, but even the barren wilderness can be transformed into pasture. So is that what we're meant to recognize in Jesus' curious tale? Is this a part of the divine nature that we are meant to imitate in our own inadequate way? And if so, what might that generosity look like in practice? I want to suggest three areas where that generosity of spirit might just inform the way we think and act. Our generosity can be seen, I think, in the ways that we adapt and give and welcome. In recent weeks, we've had to adapt in the way that we shop and much else in order to protect one another. And we are adapting now in the way we worship together to make it as safe as we can so that worship can in fact happen and can be accessible to as many as possible of those who want to come. Willingness to adapt ungrudgingly for the sake of others takes real generosity of spirit. It costs us, but it is necessary for at least some of us to flourish. In similar vein, the most obvious channel for our generosity is in our giving, what we do with our hard-earned pennies. Quite rightly, we like to know that any charitable donations are used wisely to be sure that we are making a difference in the things that are important to us. And yet for us in the church, although there are things that we can instantly recognize and value, brighter and greener lights in here, new carpeting in St. Catharines, the ministry team we rely on, There are other areas that we just don't see. We also have to meet the relatively unglamorous costs of administration, maintenance, insurance, and the shared burdens of the diocese and the national church. All those hidden things without which we gradually grind to a halt. Generosity in this case comes from the willingness to give not just towards the things that we personally value or benefit from, but to the church as a whole for the life of the whole. We may well find ourselves funding or being funded by other Christians whose beliefs and practices are rather different from our own. That kind of generosity can be difficult on all sorts of levels, but it's what we're asked to do as fellow members of the body of Christ. Then there's the generosity of welcome, and I'm not thinking so much of the events or social groups that we put on for other people, none of which can happen just now, but of the way we think about the people who choose to come to us for reasons of their own, because we can now celebrate weddings and baptisms, for example. It's easy for us to be dismayed when families come here for a while before a baptism and then we never see them again. Did we do something wrong, we wonder, or was that always the intention? It's hard sometimes not to be irritated with couples who seem to treat this building as a glamorous backdrop for their big day, their wedding day, but apparently without much thought for what it's actually here for. And yet, for all of those, there are others for whom the impact of coming here and of being welcomed amongst us is profound. Does it really matter, then, if some of those people do soon forget what was here or remain largely indifferent to it, if even one person finds God's love here and responds? I'm pretty clear in my mind what Jesus would say about that. With any of these life events, as with the public and social groups and activity days we'll hopefully return to before too long, what we are doing is sowing seeds, making connections with people so that they can more easily connect with God. As with Jesus' parable, 
some of that seed will remain dormant, only to burst into life much later. Some will never come to much at all. And some will amaze us or someone else with their growth. We simply don't know what our efforts will lead to. That is God's province. What we can do is prepare the ground in the way that we transmit the word of God, taking care over what we do and the warmth with which we acknowledge others. We can strive to share God's gifts as liberally as the rainfall, without prejudging anyone's response, our own included. And then we have to trust that God will accomplish his purposes through us and through those unknown to us in his own way and at the time of his choosing. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are not yet permitted to sing, and so to give us a little time to reflect this morning, we're going to hear now a piece of all the music by J.S. Bach, based on the German hymn, Leads the Jesu, wir sind hier. Dearest Jesus, we are here to listen to you and to your word. Direct our minds and desires towards the wisdom of heaven, so that from the earth our hearts may be drawn to you. In a moment, there was 
will stand to affirm our faith, and this morning we'll use the traditional form of the Apostles' Creed, I think many of you will be more familiar with. Um, if you feel confident to join in with me, please feel free to do so. If you'd rather let the words ring around you and join at the end, we'll end with the phrase, Amen, I believe, its own statement of faith. Would you then stand up? Seed of God's word, sown in good soil, watered by his rain, and warmed by his sunlight, produces a good crop of spiritual fruit. Gathered together as the people of God, and attentive to his will, let us pray. Heavenly Father, may your words of truth take root in our hearts and grow to rich maturity. May we hear your will for us and act upon it. May we take seriously our responsibility to encourage and nurture one another in faith at every age and every stage. This week on Tuesday, we have the commemoration of John Keeble, priest, Tractarian, poet. And as most scholars would agree, Dr. Keeble is the instigator of what has come to be known as the Oxford Movement, with its call to return to holiness and the beauty and joy of worship was experienced in the early church and has influenced so much of Church of England worship, especially in our own church here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, may every act of selfless giving and every search for truth be richly blessed and rewarded disturb assumptions and lead many to ponder more deeply the spiritual dimensions of their lives. May the word of God reach all who are ready to receive it and let us set no boundaries here as to who they might be. So we pray for your world, Lord. Remember at this time for the peoples of Hong Kong and Turkey, their political trauma, for the people of Yemen, many who are starving because of man's inhumanity to man. And as we mark the 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica atrocities, we pray for those who are still scarred by that violence. And we pray that men of violence will turn from their wickedness and seek peace. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, make our homes places of love and growth, welcoming to all who visit them. 
and accepting and forgiving to all who are nurtured there. Help us through the quarrels and heartaches and remind us to honour one another as your cherished ones. We pray for all those nationally and locally, secular and religious, who have decisions to make about what we may and may not do as we emerge from lockdown. We give thanks for the resumption of marriages in church. And we pray for Andrew and Victoria Hanton, married here yesterday. We pray for all whose plans have been disrupted because of lockdown and for those who continue to prepare for marriages that may be somewhat delayed. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, may all whose bodies, souls, or minds are aching know comforting and strengthening power of your companionship and the healing work of your love. May we be more ready to support and befriend one another through the difficult times in the name and love of the God we worship. We pray for all those who are ill, for those who are still shielding, for those concerned about catching the virus. We pray for the work of our lay pastoral assistants and for those who they minister to and for those who they cannot visit at this time. We pray for all those who work in our hospitals and care homes, for all who minister to the sick. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who are making the journey through physical death as they put down earthly things and wake to your presence. Bring us all to share with them your life in all its fullness. We pray for all those who have died suddenly and unprepared. And for those who have died recently, we pray for the soul of Fred Duffy. We pray for Doreen, his wife, and for all who mourn at this time, especially for those who have been unable to attend funerals of loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, the rain and sunshine, the growing and harvesting, sing to us of your faithful love, and we offer you our thankful praise for all your gifts to us as we join together in the prayer that our Saviour himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them to trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you once again to Dan Brown for his expertise and time in recording this service for us and to those who willingly took part in it this morning. Thank you. Um, just two things to mention for this uh, on the, the weeks ahead. We have a, a number of virtual meetings coming up. 
Um, Friday of this week is the next Bible Book Club, looking at Isaiah, the middle bit, Isaiah 2. Um, if you'd like to join that virtual meeting at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoon, please email me to let me know and I will send you the link for that. Um, a little further ahead, Grapevine plans to meet again on the 4th of August, again by Zoom, and the PCC on the 13th of August, both of those at 7.30 in the evening. I will attempt to include both of those in the weekly update, if I remember, um, but I've told you now just in case. Um, and finally, on Wednesday morning, church is open again from 9 till 10 for private prayer. Let us stand then for God's blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.